Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Infuse Your Future podcast, where we bring together people and ideas who make the world a better place. I'm your host, Carla Persnani. Let's head into today's episode. Hey, everybody, I'm excited to welcome today's guest, Christina Smith, who is a life coach for midlife women. Hi, Christina, how are you today? I am well. Thanks for having me on, Carla. Yeah, thanks for being here. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and who you are and how you got passionate about coaching and decided to become a coach? Oh, yeah. Whew, that's a, you know, life story, right? A uh, bad childhood. And by my mid 30s, I was, uh, I had checked all the boxes that my mom had told me, hey, you know, Christina, if you go to college and you get the job and you get the husband and you get the house and you blah, 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 you'll be happy when you get there. Um, and so what happened for me was I was actually the most depressed I had ever been once I checked off all those boxes and I couldn't figure out why I was really anxious. I had no confidence in my own skills or self in any way. And I really cried on the way to work for about a year, um, before I was like, mm, maybe there's something wrong with this and I should go figure this out. And so I went to therapy and I found out that I had these like really awful beliefs, um, from my childhood and they always, uh, kept me stuck in not knowing if I was showing up right. And I always thought other people were going to judge me because I'm of the Gen X uh, generation. And when we were young, most of our parents said, what will they think? What will they think if you do that? If you say that, if you wear that, what will they think, whoever they are? And so I got really stuck um, in always thinking about what other people thought about my life. And after a great amount of therapy and um, coaches and support circles, I realized I had been living someone else's life. Like I had been doing what I thought they wanted me to do. I had a great job. I had a college degree, but I was doing what everybody else thought I should do. Um, or at least what I was projecting what everybody else thought I should do. Um, and I really spent the last 15 years just rearranging my life and really asking myself that question, what is it that I want? Um, which I had never answered in a really clear way. Um, so yeah, so that's the short, that's the longer version, I guess, <laughs> of my story or the medium version. But that's really where I started um, asking myself, how do I self-validate? How do I start deciding how I want to show up instead of thinking about how everybody else wants me to show up or do the things that everybody else wants me to do instead of really doing what I want. Um, and that's what I focus on with women. I focus um, on how do we get to the point where we can self-validate and we're not craving all that external validation. And we feel really good about the way that we show up in the world. Um, I really struggled with this because when I moved, when I was young, we moved every like six months. And so I didn't make really great social connections. And so there was that part of me that always thought there was something wrong with me. Um, and so, you know, that's what was really holding me back. Um, and so I've, I've built skills and tools for people so that they can feel good about how they show up in their relationships or friendships or connections, whatever that is. That's great. Now you mentioned that you cried every day on the way to work. So what shifted, uh, you know, Ooh. at, at one point, did you stop crying? At, have you found yourself yet? No, I kept crying um, until I was just like, wow, something needs to change. And luckily for me at that point, I had a lot of health problems with my guts. Um, and I mean, that's a huge sign too, is like <laughs> when there's something wrong with your guts all the time, there's definitely something else going on and it's not necessarily physical. So I tried to solve that issue because that was an issue that I thought I could fix. I really didn't have any idea in the beginning that it had to do with how I was thinking about myself and the anxiety that I was putting on myself. Um, I actually went through health coaching school too, because all the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with me and no amount of pills they gave me was fixing it. Um, and so I went to health coaching school because I thought, well, maybe it's the way that I'm living my life and I need to live it a different way. Um, 
And so I changed a lot of the food and that helped, but that really wasn't it. It really was about going to therapy and starting to uncover the wounds that I had from my childhood that I had not healed. Um, and a lot of that had to do with um, people pleasing and external validation and doing what other people thought I should do and not really knowing who I was and what I wanted. So that's, I think the physical, if it hadn't been for the physical pain, I, I don't know if I would have ever gotten out of that. I would have probably just settled in. We can, we tend to get into this cozy space and we're like, well, my job's pretty good, right? Like there's nothing wrong there. It was a really nice company that I worked for. There was nothing wrong with my job. There was nothing wrong at home. And so I spent a lot of time shaming myself and going, Christina, you should really feel grateful. You should really be happy. This is better than it was when you were a child. Why aren't you, you know, and I went, and then I got into this shame spiral because I couldn't feel grateful. And so I went round and round and round. And it obviously the shame spiral isn't the thing that's going to heal you. <laughs> now, um, obviously this is a journey mm. and we're never done with our work. How many years did it take you to get from the start of that journey to where you are now? Tell us what that looked like. So that was about 15 years ago. Uh, since then, I often have a therapist. I, like you said, it's never an ending. But there was a lot of things that I did do. I got involved in an organization called womanwithin.org and that was, I went through a personal growth weekend. Um, I sat in circles with women after that weekend. Um, and I've been in many women's circles now. And that was a huge support for me. Um, Cause I didn't realize that other women were feeling the same way that I was feeling. We always tend to think I'm alone. I'm the only one who feels this way. I'm the only one who thinks this way. And so having circles of women probably was the most impactful thing that I've had. I've done a ton of work. And what happened along the way? Well, there's there's layers. You know, they always talk about personal growth. It comes off in like layers of an onion, right? Like the first one was like just seeing how I was thinking about myself, just seeing that I was like always folding to what other people wanted from me. Um and then it gets to that point where it's like, okay, well, where's my boundary? And creating boundaries was a huge piece of that, right? Uh, just just being able to enforce my boundaries. That's a whole nother level, right? Like we create boundaries, but then we're like, well, <laughs> I don't really want to enforce it because that's hard. And I don't want to tell this person, no, I don't want them to think less of me. And that's so for a people pleaser, that's really hard to let go of. Um, so there was that layer of letting go. And really, I mean, I can tell you, I'm still on my healing journey because I just, um, this year, uh, when I go to staff women's weekends, there's a visualization that we do, uh, before participants get there. And we do one about, um, an inner child and our wise elder. And this was the first year, just several months ago, where my inner child showed up and she was happy. She was like, you got a great life. This is the exact life I wanted for you. I wanted to have when I was a kid. You got lots of friends. You are like, it was, it was so impactful. I'm like, I'm going to cry about it just thinking about it, but just seeing her for the first time, like being that joyful because when I first met my inner child in a visualization, she was like a screaming temper tantrum mess. And so that was like the biggest confirmation for me that things have really shifted and that that inner child part of me is, you know, is healed a lot more. I don't think that she's ever going to be completely healed. That's not how we are as human beings, unfortunately. But she is really confident that the empowered part of me is going to take care of her. And I think that that's what really makes her feel happy about it. That makes me really happy for your inner child. <laughs> yeah, me too. Because <laughs> I know that that kid, for a while. <laughs> that kid can struggle, especially as we get further into adulthood. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me about the shift. Are you still working at your job? Have you shifted completely into coaching? Yeah, I've uh, let go of my job. I guess it's been almost 10 years now. 
Uh, uh, and I, this is my full-time gig is actually coaching women. And it's really lovely. I, I found the impact of women's circles so deep that I, I, um, create, uh, small groups of women. So I don't do a whole lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching. My coaching is really bringing like four women together and coaching each of them in front of each other because they learn so much from each other. And again, they also get that feeling like, ah, oh, I know that feeling and, oh, you're not alone and me too, you know? And so I think that that is so impactful for women. Yeah, I can imagine. Now, I know when we make a big life change like this, or when we do a deep dive into our inner selves, our younger selves, there's usually a really deep why underneath. Mm -hmm. Do you want to share with us what your why is, why you're so passionate about what you do, why you decided to switch from a, a stable job to coaching um, to help other women? Yeah. And believe me, there's been many times where I'm like, maybe I should just get a job because owning your own business is uh, more than just coaching. Why do I do it? Because I think that Gen X was really cut out of emotions, was really taught, especially women, how to be more masculine, right? I was told we had to work twice as hard as a man to be recognized, that in order to make it in, in the business world, I would have to show up as a man, that showing up as a woman and being flowery and feminine was not acceptable. And so I had a very, very strong masculine warrior kind of energy within me. And I did a lot of things. And I mean, it's really great the things that I've accomplished. But once I got to midlife, I realized how stressful and exhausting it was for my body to constantly be working 60, 70 hours a week. Um, and that was the pressure I put on myself, right? And so why I do this is because there's so many women like me that were taught that their masculinity was more important than their femininity. I want us all to go back to that point where we can like hear our own inner wisdom and feel what is right for us and really do that internal journey that I spent so many years doing um, and still doing, of course, um, but really looking at who am I? What is it that I want? And it's a constant question because, I mean, every decade, it's like a whole new me. Like, I, I it's so funny because 20 years ago, my 20 something year old self would have been like, what do you mean you're going to be a life coach? Like, that's <laughs> crazy. I don't even know what that means. You know, I was not in a family that went to therapy or anything. I was like the first in my family to go to therapy. So I want women to really step into knowing that femininity is actually a strength that uh, part of femininity is being able to intuit what it is that we need and listen to our bodies, which we were told not to do for a very long time, because whatever we were angry or sad about when we were young was not acceptable. I always heard that like, that's nothing to be sad about. That's nothing to be angry about. And we were told to get rid of our feelings and feelings are the most important indicators as to what's going on for me. Um, and so I want women to get back into their bodies and be able to hear themselves and live their lives from their own knowing and not other people's or culture or society. So true. Now, I know one of the, the main thing that you wanted to talk about today is self-belief, mm. defining what confidence is, um, how external validation and self-validation kind of tie into all of this. Yeah. So why don't you talk about that a little bit for us yeah. today? So confidence, what I love about confidence is there's like so many people think it's a feeling like, oh, I can't wait till I feel confident. And they think that when I get to be professional at something or a master at something, then I'm going to feel confident. Well, it's easy to have confidence when we're really good at something, right? It's harder before that. But the great thing about confidence is confidence is actually a skill. And if it's a skill, it means that it's something that we can actually learn and there's ways to learn it and practice it, right? So it's not something that one day I'm just going to wake up and feel confident, that's not how it works. Um, but confidence isn't fulfilling other people's 
view of you, right? That's not what it's about. So self-validation to me, um, confidence comes from me being able to say to myself, good job. You really tried that thing. Even if I failed, I want to know that I showed up for the thing. Because what used to happen for me and what used to hit my confidence is, um, for example, I used to plan big corporate events. So I planned this huge event, multi-classes going on all day, hundreds of people. And one little thing went wrong right? It's like, it came with a blue bow instead of a red bow. And I mean, I just was like, oh, I screwed up. I messed up everything, right? Hundreds of people had a great time, but I'm like looking at this one little detail and I'm, I'm shaming myself and guilting myself. Oh, I should have known. I should have done something and trying to control things that I just don't have any control over right? So, so many of us judge ourselves on how the outcome of something came. And I think that's really garbage because we don't control other people. We don't control acts of God or circumstances. And so judging ourselves on, did we win? Did we get what we wanted is not the proper way. And so instead, what I try to teach women to do is how do you want to show up? And then once you have that to find, then you can look back at the goal, at, at your project or whatever it is that you just did, and you can say, did I show up the way that I wanted to? Great. And uh, my words this year are like bold, open, and love. So did I show up uh, for that workshop with boldness, openness, and love? If I did, then I win. I've, I can celebrate, even if that workshop didn't turn out the way I wanted to, or that hard conversation, right? That's another one is like people, like they think that they can say the magic thing to get the conversation to go the way that they want to. And we can't, so we can't all the time. Sometimes we can, but um, that's not going to work out all the time. So instead of us deciding, well, did that conversation go the way that I wanted to? Did I show up the way that I wanted to? Because that's what I control. And so I take women through a process of deciding, like, how is it that you want to feel? So one way of doing this is if you do have goals in mind, you can look at the goal and imagine yourself at the end of that goal and being successful. And, you know, everything goes wonderfully. How would you feel, right? How would you want to feel at the end of that? Um, and then those are your words. Like I believe intentions are feeling words. And so if I go intentionally with, for me, bold, open, and love, whatever your happy is, is what your words are. But for me, those are the three this year. And so I can always, I can always double check myself and say, okay, did I show up to that project with boldness, openness, and love? Great. If I did, that's the best I can do. Did I show up to that hard conversation that way? If I did, then it doesn't matter what the other person thinks of me because I know I feel good about the way that I showed up. And that's how we want to start self-validating ourselves. It's, it sounds like too simple of a process, but I'm telling you this works. I have clients who have been using this for years and they're amazed by themselves every day and they have a lot more to celebrate, right? Because we celebrate every time we show up that way. Not every time life shows up the way that we want it to because we can't control that. So this is, this is a process of really validating yourself on, on what we actually control, which is just ourselves. Oh, that's really great. Mm. Um, I know that's been a successful tool for myself as well. When you're feeling down, imagine how you would feel if you felt amazing. If you had all the money you needed to spend, if all of your relationships were great, how would you be feeling? Mm -hmm. And if so, why aren't you feeling it now? We can't always feel that way. Just like I couldn't feel grateful when I wanted to feel grateful, right? So I don't want to shame anybody for not being able to feel that way. But we're really complex human beings where we can feel sad and angry and we can move forward with intention, right? So it's both and. And if, if, I'm not feeling bold, open, or love today. What is something I can do for myself to bring more of that on, right? When that becomes our focus, then we start aligning to what we want because that's what we're saying that that's the point where I want to be great. Then let me make decisions that go in that direction. And many times our defaults go in the other direction. Like 
boldness, openness, love, that doesn't come with working 60, 70 hours a week for me. Um, and so I had to start making choices over, well, I say I want this. So I can't make that other decision because that's not in the same direction. And so I have to start aligning my choices to get what I want, right? To be more bold, to be more open, to be more loving. And once I do that, then it becomes easier. But that's the hard part in between is like trying to reconcile our old defaults against what we truly want. Um, and those can be completely different directions. And they probably are. If you're not getting what you want, you're probably making old default decisions that they don't fit with you anymore. Um, I had this belief that I had to work hard. And to, to that point, it was like work hard meant work lots of hours and do hard things. And so I would make things hard <laughs> just to feel like, oh, I've accomplished something, right? And that is not the way to do it. And that is definitely not going to bring me the bold and the open and the love that I want. This is a journey, right? It just doesn't That's... happen overnight. And <clears throat> as you're learning how to be bold, open, and, and have more love in your life, there's going to be some pitfalls along the way. You're mm -hmm. going to stumble. So just being able to love yourself and continue with that self validation mm -hmm. is an important part. Mm -hmm. You can't right. climb the mountain in one day. Right. Exactly. So if I'm feeling sad and angry, I can accept that. I can accept that I'm feeling sad and angry right now. And I can still be pointed in the direction of my intentions, right? This is, how I want to feel. It's okay that I am where I am. And this is the direction I want to walk in. Um, and so it just gives us, it gives us a focus. And I often talk about this like survival versus thriving. And surviving to me is like being in the ocean and just trying to like keep your head above water. And all your, you're just focused on the water and the sharks and the, you know, all the other things that could be going on that are dangerous. And you're just constantly looking for the sharks, looking for the sharks. Thriving, well, and many of us, all we want to do, this happens all the time when I ask women, you know, what are the, if I had a magic wand, what were three things that you would change? And they'd be like, well, I don't want this and I don't want that. And I don't want this. And I don't want that. Well, not wanting something that's not really clarity. It's on your way to clarity, but that's not really clarity. That's like trying to get to shore. That's all I want to do is get to shore. Whew. Like, so I can breathe. Right. Many of us get stuck in survival mode because we're human beings and that's our DNA. Our DNA is really good at surviving. It's really good at running away from things or, you know, avoiding things that make us uncomfortable. What we're not good is thriving. Thriving is running towards something that we want. That's a little different than running away, isn't it? I'm going to run faster away from something than I am towards something, especially because right between survival and thrival is this like comfort zone that we have. It's so cozy. I don't want to leave it. And it may be uncomfortable in some ways, but we know the ways that it's uncomfortable rather than risking things to get out of our comfort zone and go into thriving. But thriving is like the mansion on the island hill, right? Like it's way up there in the clouds. And often we can't think that far. If we have a hard time imagining or dreaming, especially in midlife, and that's where we want to be. I don't want women to set their intentions off of, oh, I finally got to shore and I can breathe. I want them to set them off. What if I was in that mansion? I mean, I don't want a mansion. It could just be a little house with lots of space, <laughs> lots of yards. That would probably have me running faster, less to clean. But whatever that looks like, right? <laughs> that mansion on the hill, that cottage on the hill, whatever it is that you want it, the castle, right? Whatever that castle looks like for you. That's where we want to be. That's what intentions are. My bold, my open, my love, it lives up there on that mountain. That's if I got up that mountain, that's how I would feel. And so I think, so the big part around that is it's what we focus on. When we're surviving, we're focusing on all the things that we don't want. 
because we're like, oh, I gotta fight this, I gotta fight that, I gotta fight this. And chances are, there's probably no sharks in the water, but we're so concerned about it that that's where all of our energy is, right? And we're attracting sharks because we're like looking for them rather than swimming to shore and climbing that mountain. Um, and instead, uh, the whole idea behind intentions is that it keeps your eye on the castle. That's what I want. That's what I'm making choices for because every day, there's stuff that we can get stuck in. We can get stuck in drama any day, right? We can get stuck in our problems all the time and try to overthink them. At least my brain loves to think about things that stress me out because it's like, I'm going to solve this. I'm going to solve this. And it's not going to solve it because there's some things that we cannot control or solve. <laughs> and so uh, this is a point of giving ourselves that castle to look at and go up. Oh, nope. That's where I'm going. That's where I want to go. Right. Let me make choices in alignment with that. I'm going to stop looking for sharks. I'm going to start, you know, swimming and running towards that mountain instead. And so that's what intentions are for so that we can keep flipping our brain back to what we want instead of all this stuff that we don't want. Cause I mean, I think the phrase is, uh, what you focus on grows. And so we're trying to grow the mountain, right? Not the sharks. <laughs> I love all those analogies, especially the moving toward versus running away from. That's mm -hmm. such a paradigm shift. Yes, yes, it is. And so hard for us as human beings because we're so used to running from bears. But most of the time, there's not a safety issue. Most of us, I mean, if we're sitting here recording this, if there's people listening we don't have major problem. Like we're not running from bears. We don't have physical violence, like we or physical safety issues, like we used to. Um, we're rather safe now. A lot of the stuff that we go through is uncomfortable, but we don't have a shark coming after us every day. And our brains. Um, what happens with our brains is they like to find the shark. <laughs> so they'll start creating stories to be like, oh no, this is going to be tragic. If it rains tomorrow when you're supposed to go to the park, it's going to be tragic, right? And so we start thinking those things are like safety issues and our brain confuses them. So anything that's uncomfortable, we want to avoid. And yet the discomfort is where all of our growth is. Now, how do you help your clients find the balance between the external and the internal validation? Because I know, especially when you're starting the process, we need a little bit of both because mm -hmm. we can have all the internal validation that we want, but in order to survive in the world, we also need relationships. Mm. So at a, at a certain, for a certain degree, we need the external validation. And plus, you know, our culture lives in this world of just constant barrage of media and messages and things mm -hmm. like that, that are constantly questioning, um, your validity. Mm -hmm. So how do you help your clients get the both and get the balance between the external and, and the internal validation, especially as they're just starting their journey? Mm. So we uh, talk a lot about archetypes. Um, I know it sounds like it's going tangential, but really this comes back to it. But archetypes are, you know, energies that like we talked about inner child, that's an archetype, the wise woman, that's an archetype, mother. And they're the same, if we said these words a thousand years ago, we would get the same energy, right? Child, playful, curious, uh, mother, going to be nurturing and birthing and, and teaching, right? And old wise woman, she's just got that wise energy and she's calm and she just kind of takes things with stride. So we talk about two energies that talk about this balance, the wild woman and the maiden. So um, the maiden energy is very much about the world. Like she wants to fit in. She wants to uh, conform is really what she wants to do because she wants to be the thing that everybody needs so that she can move forward in her life. She feels like that, that that's important. On the other end is the wild woman and she does not give 
a stink about social media or media or culture. She's really internal and she's like, she's just spontaneous. Whatever comes up for her, that's what she wants to do. She wants to paint her hair purple. She'll do it, right? She does not care. She'll walk half naked. Like I always think about the women like dancing naked around fires, right? Like that's our wild woman. She doesn't care what other people think. And there is a balance to those because... <laughs> Some jobs don't allow you to have purple hair or come in with, you know, half your clothes off. Right? You can't go to work in a bikini every day. And so there are parts that of us that need to conform. But it's really about feeling it out. What is important to me? Maybe I am going to dye my hair purple because I don't care what they think, right? I don't care what my mother's going to say or that person's going to say. But there might be other times that we want to conform a little bit. I'm a little bit more on the wild woman side. I think midlife women should, could, I don't want to shame anybody, but could be as well. Because as we age, we have, you know, less care about what other people say. You know, we give less, you know, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we just don't care as much. So I think as we age, we get to step wilder and wilder into that, you know, wild woman rather than conforming with society. And I think that that's really brave. It's really brave to show up bold, open, and love when people don't want me to. It's really brave to show up exactly authentically rather than putting that mask on all the time. I, I just can't do it, actually. I'm not really good at conforming or putting a mask on anymore um, because it doesn't feel right. Like that whole phrase, fake it till you make it, can't stand it. It drives me nuts. <laughs> face it till you make it maybe, but fake it yeah. and don't ever fake it. Like that faking it reminds me of, I was a bartender for like 12 years and having to put that smile on, even when I just wanted to like, my heart was breaking or I just wanted to like ooh, blow up at the person. Um, it's just so fake. And so I think as as we age, some women call it the rewilding. Um, so there is a balance, but I say challenge that balance, challenge, challenge the status quo, because when one of my clients do that, it gives permission to the other women around her to also go, oh, I can stand up for myself. I can be myself. And that's either going to be okay or it's not going to be okay. And I, I think that the people who truly love us want to see our real selves, not the conformer. Um, it's just the conformer can be quite a people pleaser. Isn't that the truth? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we now, lose our people. Go ahead. I was just going to say, then we lose ourselves because we become, we become this image of what other people, what we think other people want us to be rather than really like, I like myself now that I've gotten to know myself. Right. I did not like the part of me that was constantly looking for that approval because I could point out all the things, oh, they're not going to like you because you said this or you did that or you didn't do enough of that. And now that I know myself, like there's like, I, I like me. I wish there was more of me to hang out with. I would hang out with me. And so that's what we get when we start stepping into authenticity. But we cannot do that by saying, what does this person need from me? What do I need from me? That's more important. And when I'm fulfilling that, that's when my inner child is happy and is like, yes, you're standing up for me. You're being authentic. I don't have to hide or pretend to be someone else. And that feels beautiful. Yeah. There's nothing better than feeling authentic mm -hmm. and trusting yourself and not caring, not being a people pleaser all the time. Yes. I mean, and you can still, I, sometimes when I say that people are like, oh, well, you know, I think it's important to do things for other people. I never said that wasn't true, but I want to be able to do them because I want to be able to do them. Not because I think I should. I hate that word should, but not because I think I should, but because I want to give that because my glass is full and I have leftover to hand out, you know, that's where I want to be. I just don't want to be 
worrying about whether or not they're going to judge me, well, let them judge me, you know, because the people who love me know me and they're going to love me anyway, you know? So beautifully said. Mm. Now, if people want to work with you, if someone's out there listening to this, this podcast and they're like, oh, I really love what she has to say. I want to work with her. How are people going to find you? Yeah, they can go to uh, invitingshift.com is my website. There's a confidence toolkit on there. So go check it out. You'll have the tools yourself to be able to um, have more confidence, build your skills of confidence. I'm on the Instagram and the Facebook too. Christina Smith XOXO is me. Um, so please reach out and let's get your confidence back because I just I love when women feel good about who they are me too now I always love to end each episode with a call to action something that people mm -hmm. can do for themselves today in this case it would be around self-validation self-belief mm -hmm. what can people do out there they don't have to invest they don't have to wait a lot of time they can do it right now with the resources they have do you have a call to action for people I challenge you lean into your strengths rather than trying to fix your flaws. Um, create a list of all your strengths and your gifts. What makes you beautiful? This isn't about a compare and despair kind of deal. This is about my skills, my gifts, because we all have a unique combination of them. And here's a bigger challenge. Ask your friends what they think your biggest strengths and gifts are. And that is hard for us to ask for compliments or you know or good things right we don't we don't like to do that use your big brave and go out there and ask your friends family associates whatever what do they think your gifts are and i think you might be really surprised about how people actually see you and some of the gifts that they see in you that you do not see in yourself and then lean into those gifts if all we're doing again is staring at what's wrong we're not looking at what we really want. I want to grow my strengths and my gifts. So that's the one tip that I would have is get a list of your gifts and strengths together and look at that every day and really lean into those. That is such great advice. Oh, thank you. Well, Christina, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you, Carla. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks for listening. And I hope you really enjoyed today's episode. I would love it if you clicked like or subscribe, and even share this episode with someone else that you think might enjoy it. Have a great day.